Tonight, a community reeling after two police officers were killed. Words cannot describe our grief. What we know about the constables, the suspect, and the shooting that took place inside a home. A billion dollar lie. InfoWars founder Alex Jones ordered to pay up for spreading conspiracies. The internet is not the wild, wild west. Your actions have consequences. But will families ever see a cent? And the worries for thousands and thousands of women who did not get a mammogram during the pandemic. Very hard to not be angry at could it have been caught earlier. What it means for patients being diagnosed now. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for joining us. There is a real sense of disbelief and shock tonight in a small community north of Toronto. People in Innisfil, Ontario are grappling with a horrifying scene, a shooting that's left three people dead, including two police officers. 33-year-old Constable Devin Northrup and 54-year-old Constable Morgan Russell, both with the South Simcoe Police Service. Both were remembered tonight at a vigil. I don't know the words to say to these officers' moms, but I know my heart, my heart has been hurting for you all day today. That is just a sense of the emotion in the town tonight as community members and first responders gather to pay their respects. Katie Nicholson is in a very hurt Innisfil tonight with what we're learning about the suspect. The cop the ambulance? Emergency vehicles tore through a quiet country road just after 8 Tuesday night. Hours later, a neighborhood still in shock. I heard about uh, 7 to 12 gunshots go off right at around uh, 10 after 9. I thought maybe it was fireworks. Um, so I went outside and quickly ran over to the house and um, it was uh, pandemonium over there. In that pandemonium, three men killed. A 22-year-old days away from his 23rd birthday and two police officers. Words cannot describe our grief. Constable Devin Northrop, just six years on the job, worked with the service's mental health crisis outreach team. And Morgan Russell, a 33-year veteran and trained crisis negotiator. Their deaths, two gaping holes in a small police force in a small town. We're just broken. Our, our hearts are broken for the families and for our police colleagues. Ontario's police watchdog is now tasked with finding out what happened after the family of the 22-year-old called for help. There was an exchange of gunfire between two officers and the man, and that man was pronounced deceased at the scene. Sources close to the investigation told the Canadian press and the Toronto Star that man was Christopher Doncaster. He was enlisted in the Canadian Armed Forces for seven months back in 2020, and court records show he had a few run-ins with police in 2018 and 2019. Amber Henry says she and Doncaster were close. I think he was just um, living his day-to-day -day life right now, helping his grandparents out and stuff right now. What happened on this street will take weeks, possibly months, to be revealed in full, and perhaps even longer for those who live here to process. Bad things happen everywhere. Bad things happen, you know, down in the city. Bad things happen up in the suburbs. So uh, it's a pretty sad day for um, us here in Simcoe County. So Katie, you've been on site all day. I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of what you've seen and heard. Yeah, all day we've been watching forensics investigators in and out of the house where this happened, carrying evidence bags. We also saw police carry away two vehicles from the driveway uh, on big flatbed trucks uh, that had evidence stickers on them. We also learned from SIU today that uh, Christopher Doncaster's autopsy is scheduled for Friday, so we may get more answers about the cause of his death. And typically, these, these sorts of investigations take 120 days to conclude, so that's really the time frame you're looking at. One other thing we got a detail about the type of weapon he had. It was a rifle type weapon. Adrian? All right, Katie Nicholson in Innisfil, Ontario. Thank you.
Turning now to Hockey Canada and a CBC News exclusive, we have new details from a preliminary report into the use of private funds to settle sexual misconduct claims. Ashley Burke now with what those confidential documents reveal. The Prime Minister today meeting with the future of hockey in Canada and talking about Hockey Canada's current problems. Get sort of the lessons around governance and what you've been able to build around women's hockey to uh, seep over into uh, and beyond that, uh, that old boys network at, at, uh, at Hockey Canada. CBC News has exclusive new details from a preliminary report commissioned by Hockey Canada. It's found serious flaws with how the organization handled a fund used to pay out sexual assault claims. We didn't want to litigate this. Or hockey Canada's now ousted CEO faced outrage from hockey parents over using a reserve fund to settle a $3.5 million lawsuit that alleged eight hockey players, including members of the 2018 World Junior Team, sexually assaulted a heavily intoxicated woman. We made the decision to use the National Equity Fund as I presented um, on June the 20th in the best interest of the young woman. The report by retired Supreme Court Justice Thomas Cromwell found reserve funds to cover uninsured liabilities is not only sound, but the failure to do so would be a serious oversight, but recommended sweeping changes after discovering major issues. A lack of policies and procedures, financial disclosure and transparency. I think it's totally fine to have a fund like this to cover uninsured claims, provided that you're transparent about it. And that was what was missing here. The report also found that Hockey Canada didn't disclose that about $13 of insurance fees per player was being transferred into the National Equity Fund. Cromwell wrote that some provincial federations said they knew the fund was used for historical claims, but did not think its use would include protecting predators going forward. This is an example of what can go wrong. Liz Watson helps companies find board members and teaches them about good governance. In this case, there really were no rules and it was a way to ensure that athletes were protected and without regard for the overall sense of values that the organization should stand for. So Ashley, what else stood out to you from this report? Well, Adrian, that Hockey Canada broke disclosure rules. It's supposed to notify its provincial federations that any time it uses the fund to pay out more than a half a million dollars for a settlement or claim. But Cromwell found that six times since 1999 that it did not. And as for that report, we're expecting it will be made public, but it's not clear when. Provincial federations are meeting in Toronto this Saturday to vote on some of the report's recommendations, like increasing the board size with longer terms and including more women. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa, thank you. Now to the U.S., where conspiracy theorist Alex Jones is being ordered to pay roughly a billion dollars to the families of the victims of the Sandy Hook mass shooting. Katie Simpson shows us the unforgettable reaction from those families and Jones himself. Roman number one, compensatory damages. The lies of Alex Jones added so much torment to these families, many already grieving the murder of a child. The jury set out to make an example. Total of $120 million, initial by juror number one. Awarding parents and loved ones huge sums of money. All I can really say is that I'm just proud that what we were able to accomplish was just to simply tell the truth. And it shouldn't be this hard and it shouldn't be this scary. False flags. Alex Jones spent nearly a decade spewing conspiracy theories about the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Sandy Hook is a synthetic, completely fake, with actors, in my view, manufactured. Using these lies to lure viewers to his broadcasting platform, he earned millions of dollars. And Mr. Jones, in this trial, his second for defamation, families described the relentless harassment they faced as a result. You're already completely off balance, right? And then something like this comes along and people start saying stuff like this and it derails you. Jones showed zero remorse as he broadcast the court proceedings cheering each award. Total $54 million. Yeah! He laughed at the prospect of paying up. Do these people actually think they're getting any money? And then tried to fundraise off this moment. Save Infowars.com, donate now. Bite these monsters. The families don't expect Jones to change, but hope this payout sends a message to others. For someone to stand in front of a camera, probably right now as we're speaking, to spew the lies, 
to enrich themselves. Well, now there's a cost-benefit analysis that'll have to be done. Alex Jones is worth as much as $270 million, but he and his company are going through bankruptcy proceedings. Families involved hope this shuts him down for good. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith is now trying to clarify comments she made yesterday shortly after being sworn in. She said this about unvaccinated people. So they have been the most discriminated against group that I've ever witnessed in my lifetime. That's a pretty extreme level of discrimination. That sparked backlash from several communities and fellow politicians. In a statement, Smith now says she, quote, did not intend to trivialize in any way the discrimination faced by minority communities and other persecuted groups or to create any false equivalencies to the terrible historical discrimination and persecution suffered by so many minority groups over the last decades and centuries. Meanwhile, Quebec's government is urging people to roll up their sleeves as COVID hospitalizations are once again on the rise. As Alison Northcott explains, doctors are already worried about how hospitals will get through it. This is the first time in more than two years Montrealers have been able to enjoy the fall season without COVID restrictions. We are not so worried uh, like we used to be, but yeah, we are taking precautions. But cases and hospitalizations in Quebec are once again starting to rise. The health minister is urging people to get a booster shot. Right now, we don't need any new measures. We just need to use as at the maximum what we can do with vaccination. About 20% of Quebecers have had a booster in the last five months. Health officials say they help prevent severe illness and hospitalization, exactly what this couple wants to avoid. I am very concerned about it. Was it uh, my age and her age, you know, was some sickness, you know. This rise in cases comes as hospitals across the country remain under pressure and overwhelmed. It's tough to see those numbers rise because we frankly don't have any room uh, for maneuvering right now. Uh, we have, we're full, we're over capacity, more than full. With cases climbing in Europe, the World Health Organization is warning this pandemic still isn't over. And in Canada, flu season is also ramping up. It hit the southern hemisphere hard this year, which could be a sign of what's to come here. Influenza alone is able to overwhelm our emergency rooms and our capacity to admit patients. So if for, you know, bad luck, we would have a big influenza year on top of what, you know, the eighth wave of COVID, then it is very possible that it would overwhelm the healthcare system. With no plans for new measures to control the spread of COVID-19, the province is asking people instead to make an individual effort to protect the vulnerable and limit pressure on the healthcare system. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. There is growing concern right now about the number of advanced or even undiagnosed cases of breast cancer in Canada. And here's why. After the pandemic hit, there was a big drop in routine mammograms. In Ontario, about 400,000 fewer were performed than usual. And that means some cancers that would have been caught early simply weren't. As Mike Crawley shows us, doctors are already seeing the effects of that. When Laura Greer got a mammogram last November, the radiologist ordered an immediate biopsy and told her to get a referral to a surgeon. It was one of the most traumatic parts of it because you knew it wasn't good. Greer had been due for that mammogram seven months earlier, but it was delayed by COVID backlogs. Her diagnosis? Stage four breast cancer. Very hard to not be angry at could it have been caught earlier if mammogram had happened when it, it should have happened. New figures show that Ontario's breast screening program has performed 422,000 fewer mammograms than expected since the pandemic began. That means as many as 3,000 cases of breast cancer were missed. So this is the same area. Doctors are now seeing the impact. What we're noticing is that women are presenting with bigger cancers and with their lymph nodes being involved. Here is, you see a mass. Catching the... cancer at a later stage has consequences for treatment and the chances of survival. Before that we would have done surgery uh, and maybe some radiation for, now it's surgery, radiation and maybe chemotherapy. This is not unique to Ontario. Routine mammograms also dropped off in other provinces by about one-third in British Columbia and Alberta at the start of the pandemic. 
There's been a similar trend with colon and cervical cancer. Certainly in my practice, I, I saw a wave of more advanced cancers that um, I, I think were, were linked to delays in diagnosis. Ontario's breast screening program is now back to its normal pace. This is a good time to make an appointment um, and get your mammogram in. Laura Greer is responding to treatment. I go to work full time, I have two children, I do all of those things, but you never know when um, that could change all of a sudden. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is vowing Canada will continue to help defend Ukraine and is promising more military aid. This, as the Ukrainian president says, the country is rebuilding after Russia's two-day barrage of missile and drone strikes. Vladimir Zelensky says electricity has been fully restored to most regions following the attacks, but the damage to lives is irreparable. Today, Ukraine released these images of rescuers pulling a family out of a collapsed building, miraculously escaping death. But beyond those attacks, Russia's response to its losses in Ukraine, including the recent high-profile attack on its strategic bridge to Crimea, is pretty hard to predict. And as Briar Stewart shows us from Ukraine, the danger for civilians is far from over. For the second time in five days, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe had its main source of power cut and needed to rely on backup generators. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, who was just in Russia Tuesday meeting with President Vladimir Putin, said this repeated loss of Zaporizhia's off-site power is a deeply worrying development and it underlines the urgent need for a nuclear safety and security protection zone around the site. The plant is right along the front line in the community of Enerhodar, now under Russian control. Both of these men live in that city and asked us not to show their faces. They're now in Zaporizhia recovering side by side. We met them just a few days ago after they got injured in a missile attack. They were at this checkpoint trying to cross back into occupied territory when it was slammed by three missiles. At least 30 were killed and dozens were injured as a blast tore through a line of vehicles and a nearby market. I was standing 40 meters away. I saw people fall down and scream and everything else. Despite the horror and the danger, the men want to return to Anerhodar as soon as they can to be with their families. There are bombings every day without a pause, day and night bombings. There's absolutely no way out. This is the kind of fear we live in. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Putin has called the nuclear power plant a concern, but had stronger words for the damage to Russia's Nord Stream pipelines. Swedish investigators suggested they were sabotaged last month, and Putin blames terrorists. The logic is cynical, he said, to destroy and block sources of cheap energy. Russia blames Ukraine for the explosion that rocked its prize bridge to Crimea over the weekend. Security services say they've detained eight people, among them Russians, Ukrainians and an Armenian for being involved with the truck, which Russia says was full of explosives. Tomorrow, Putin will meet with Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who's expected to propose peace talks. But given that Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has said he will not negotiate with Putin, doesn't look very promising. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Dnipro. Now to those promises by Canada and other NATO countries to continue helping Ukraine. Allies met in Brussels today to find ways to boost Ukraine's air defenses. But as Marie Brewster explains, the scale of war in Ukraine is stretching donor countries to the limit. A close call for a driver in the southern Ukrainian city of Dnipro amid a rain of Russian rockets this week. A stepped-up campaign of cruise missiles and drones, killing at least 26 people, adding urgency to Ukraine's pleas for stronger air defenses. In Brussels, NATO defense ministers were listening. I welcome that uh, NATO allies uh, are providing uh, air defense systems. Um, that is extremely important. The U.S. is shipping eight of these advanced surface-to-air systems. Germany is donating four of its Iris-T systems, the Canadian Army, however, has no air defense system to donate, even if it wanted to. 
So Canada gives what it can. Hats, gloves, boots, parkas, the items that Ukrainian soldiers need on the front lines. Winter clothes, 500,000 pieces. In addition, more howitzer ammunition, more drone cameras, and more access to surveillance satellites. $47 million in total. We are assisting with military equipment, as I've announced today. We are assisting with training, as I've just mentioned. Canada has also committed 40 combat engineers to help train their Ukrainian counterparts in Poland. In addition to combat training, Canadian and British troops are providing in the UK. But there's no sign of more armored vehicles and howitzers that Ukraine asked for earlier last month. Um, I think we've effectively exhausted all of the relatively easy and larger quantity types of uh, donations we could make um, several months ago. And now it's a question of, of incrementally doing what we can and, and waiting for some of our own shelves to get restocked. And that is the conundrum facing an increasing number of allies. For some, it speaks to the need for the defense industry to ramp up production to a so-called wartime footing something NATO defense ministers are also wrestling with. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Questions are emerging about the ancestry of a prominent Indigenous leader. My father's a Cree Indian from mm -hmm. Norway House, Manitoba. What status mm -hmm. does that give you? I'm a Treaty Indian. I'm a Treaty Indian. What a CBC News investigation reveals. Plus another night of anger on the streets of Iran while artists here show their support. I wanted to convey that Iranian women are angry and fed up. And the scandal rocking a wild competition of the season. If we hadn't caught it, Hollywood had won. We are back in two. Well, Canadians can now borrow money at the post office. Canada Post has partnered with TD Bank to offer personal loans between $1,000 and $30,000. No bank account apparently required. And applications can be done online. This is part of a push to bring more low-cost financial services to rural, remote, and Indigenous communities. We now know who is in Conservative leader Pierre Polyev's shadow cabinet. It includes some longtime supporters and some rivals. Leslie Lewis has been tapped as infrastructure critic. Scott Aitchison for housing. Both ran against Polyev in the party leadership race. Key supporter Jasraj Singh Hallen will take over as the finance critic. Other familiar faces like Michael Chong as foreign affairs critic keep their roles. Now several liberal cabinet ministers and the prime minister will testify at a highly anticipated public inquiry that begins tomorrow. It will examine the controversial and unprecedented use of the Emergencies Act to end the convoy protest back in February. Tom Perry now with what to expect. Protesters pushed back and arrested. Vehicles towed. A massive police operation after an unprecedented move by the Prime Minister invoking the Emergencies Act. It is now clear that responsible leadership requires us to do this. Months later, the streets around Parliament Hill remain closed. Well, not far away, an inquiry into that controversial government decision is about to open, examining whether triggering the act was justified or an overreach. We are going into the commission with an open mind, but in our view, the government has yet to prove that the legal threshold to invoke the act was met. Civil rights groups will be among those asking questions. So will lawyer Paul Champ, who represents businesses and community groups in downtown Ottawa. People were, were hostages in their own homes, and we want to make sure that, that that story is told. The long list of witnesses so far includes Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson, former Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly, who stepped down during the occupation, protest organizers Pat King and Tamara Leach, and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau who still stands by his February decision. From the very beginning, I offered to the Commission uh, to appear at that Commission so that Canadians could understand exactly why we had to do what we did. Under the Emergencies Act, the federal government was legally bound to set up this Commission. The inquiry will have until February to interview witnesses, pour through documents and table its final report. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa.
Protesters in Iran are facing clearly violent crackdowns, but Canadians supporting the demonstrations from afar also face danger. I just tell your sister, even in Canada, you won't be safe. I sit down with three women who say these protests are indeed revolutionary. And this is my body, just go away. The artist speaking out on canvas next. Tonight, the supreme leader of Iran is digging in with more claims that foreign enemies are behind anti-government protests gripping his country. So that was Ayatollah Ali Khamenei today playing down the protests, calling them scattered riots. Details on what's happening there are pretty limited with reports today of another major disruption in Internet services. But nearly a month after a young woman died in custody, accused of violating hijab rules, protests are still unfolding despite the growing government crackdown. One human rights group estimates more than 200 people, including children, have been killed. So as these protesters push on, Iranians around the world, including here in Canada, are watching what's happening closely. I recently sat down with three women who were all once prisoners in Iran to talk about what's at stake for their country and its future. What do you think is riding on this moment? For me, the, the social revolution has already happened. Hmm. Now we need the political revolution. Mm -hmm. So th this restaurant is not where we initially intended to talk. We wanted to speak at your home or maybe a community center, but that became really difficult because it became unsafe. We, we cannot feel uh, safe, um, even in, here in Canada. Many of us have uh, the experience of getting threats. My sister was called by the um, Ministry of Intelligence in Iran. They just harassed her a lot just because of me. So Iranian authorities called your sister in Iran asking about you here in Canada. Yeah. They, they know what you're doing, where you're living. Yes, exactly. They uh, told her, uh, just tell your sister, even in Canada, you won't be safe. So all, all three of you, uh, as Iranian women, have, have been on those streets demonstrating. You have varying experiences with being arrested and seeing terrible things. And one of the things I want to talk about is this picture here of these very young girls giving the finger to the clerics, right? This, to me, as an outsider, feels very different. Am I wrong or is this something brand new? Uh, giving fingers to the leaders, uh, you have no idea. Even saying a slightest, um, uh, thing online about the leaders would give you some uh, prison sentence, some years in prison. So this is this is beyond the pale as far yeah, as yeah. This is yeah. This they are so fearless and brave. Yes, they are more uh, brave than us. Uh, for example, in um, past protests, uh, maybe the regime uh, was able to fool us to stop protests and just start the negotiation. Each time we stop the uh, just protesting, they start execute us. And these just young fighters know how to uh, behave with this regime. So they know that they won't, they won't stop to talk. Yes. What does that tell you about the character of this protest movement? Iran has had protests, especially since 2009, in many cities, in many formats, but this protest is different. <laughs> the previous pro um, protests have either has been a kind of a reformist, they wanted, say, an integrity of electoral system, or they wanted to the regime to open up a little bit. So, so it change, was but within the system. Within the system. Or it was economic demands by usually workers and uh, factory workers or uh, for economic. In this, in this protest, the demands have gone, but it's no longer, they are no longer looking within this framework of the regime. But they want a different society and different states that has brought men and women together, young and old to, uh, together, and also people from 
um, metropolitans, these two small towns, mm -hmm. Um, because their strategy in the past was you would have a large demonstration like 2009. And so it was actually easy for the regime to crush it. Because everyone was in everyone one place? Everyone in one place. And, um, but now the protest is very fragmented. Like it happens firstly in big cities and small cities. So the security forces have to um, divide themselves in a way they can't concentrate and crush uh, in the demonstrations. The other thing is they're leaderless. Mm -hmm. So it even makes it harder for the regime to control it because they can no longer take the head of the, the protest and put them in jail and then hope that the protests will fizzle out. I just want to bring this picture up because this is, a, this is an example of some men. These are petrochemical or natural gas workers who seem to have joined the protest. Are they not terrified? I mean, they're very easily identifiable where they work. They are terrified at the same time, they, they know what they want and they want to continue. There's no going back. Uh, this is going to be, uh, this is our revolution and there's no going back. I don't know how to read this one about whether this, this protest movement is different, whether the regime is more weak now than it was before, whether this one has the potential to endure. And I, I don't know what I should be looking for, Homa. Well, the regime, even the most um, militarized regime, they still need some legitimacy. <clears throat> In the past, the regime has, has focused on the poor working class as their constituency, and they ignore the others. But right now, it's the working class and the youth are, who are in the street. <laughs> Iran is a very young society. A lot of people, more than 60, 70 percent, are under the age of 30. They have lost legitimacy across the section of the society. Even, even a lot of people think like the rank and file of people who are in, in the revolution in regard to police and, and, and military, they, they don't see the future in this regime. Iranian people want democracy. They want freedom, they want liberty, and they want uh, a normal life, to have a normal life, the, especially the young generation. I'm pretty sure we will win, but not only we will win, we will be an example in the history. And uh, every person in every corner of this world who are supporting us by tweeting, by attending rallies by signing petitions, by pushing forward politicians to take a meaningful step, will be part of this historical uh, victory. Homa Shaparak, Mariam, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. that. Thank you. thank you for having us. Now, all three women who've all been jailed in Iran for demonstrating all say that those around the world supporting the protesters make a difference in Iran and that a whole range of efforts like art matter. So Ellen Morrow takes a look at how that art helps lift those Iranian voices. The art of a movement. Inspired by brave protesters on the streets of Iran being held up around the world. Masa Amini immortalized her arrest by Iran's so-called morality police over her headscarf, her death in their custody, fueling artists, their work echoing and amplifying Iranians' cries for women, life, freedom. Take a look at this poster in Mexico City. Say her name, it says. The image designed by Iranian-Canadian artist Hajar Muradi. So this is some of the art that we've been seeing. Yes. We caught up with Hajar at her studio in Toronto. When you were creating this, tell me how you were feeling. I felt um, anger and uh, I, wanted, I wanted to convey that Iranian women are angry and fed up. <laughs> Anger has surged across Iran for weeks. Protesters demanding bodily autonomy for women and ends to the country's hardline regime. 
Some videos are getting out, but government internet blocks make it hard to see the true scale of this push for freedom and the push back against it. Q Iranian artists in the diaspora and others supporting this movement. Powerful images like these flooding social media. Hashtag Masa Amini posted, shared, and reshared tens of millions of times all around the world. The whole purpose of this is to amplify Iranian people's voice. Hajar's art helps her cope with fears for loved ones still in Iran. When you learned of Massa's death, how did that impact you and your work? Of course, there was first, there's an anger, there's a huge anger in every Iranian woman <laughs> because of decades of suppression. What we want to do and what we are trying to do is to put our anger into work. Art and action. This is Hajar and a group of friends cutting their hair at a Toronto demonstration. An act of resistance symbolizing control over one's body featured in so much of the artwork, including Hajar's most recent piece. There with her at the Toronto protest was fellow Iranian artist Samin Karamati. In her Toronto studio, Samin is working on a sculpture that will be covered with hair, dedicated to Massa and the Iranian women who've been fighting repression for decades. Much of the hair has come from protests around the world over the last few weeks. What is the significance of incorporating so much hair in this installation? What does it say? I don't know how else can I say that this is my own body. And I want, I want, this is my body, just go away. Samin was also arrested by the so-called morality police before she left Iran in 2012. When you see what's going on now, how, how are you feeling in this moment? I'm learning from this young generation of girls. They are very brave. I'm just looking at them, learning from them, and try to be their voices and they're not backing down. They are not. It seems that they are not going back. How long will it take? I don't know, but women of Iran, they win. They are the winners. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. The ancestry of a well-known indigenous leader is being questioned tonight. This is Mary Ellen Trapel Lafon. She is the first native judge in Saskatchewan. An exclusive CBC News investigation digs into her claims and reveals a different past. A CBC News investigation is raising doubts about the ancestry claims of a prominent Indigenous leader in this country, Mary Ellen Turpel Lafond. She claims to be a Treaty Indian and to have Indigenous ancestors, but that doesn't appear to be backed up by documentation. As Jeff Leo shows us, her story illustrates the complex and evolving debate around Indigenous identity in Canada. Anti-Indigenous racism. Mary Ellen Trapelafond is considered to be one of Canada's most prominent and successful Indigenous scholars and leaders. She has been a high-profile voice on behalf of Indigenous communities for decades. Mary Ellen Trapel is also with us. Even representing them during the Charlottetown Accord negotiations. Mary Ellen Trapelafond, she is the first native judge in Saskatchewan. In 1999, Trapelafond sat down with CBC's Pamela Wallen. My father's a Cree Indian from mm -hmm. Norway House, Manitoba. My mother is uh, Scottish and English, and she's from Fort William or Thunder Bay, Ontario. So yeah. I come from a bicultural background. What status mm -hmm. does that give you? I'm a Treaty Indian. I'm a Treaty Indian. Late last year, however, CBC News received tips that raised questions about Terpel Lafon's claims to Indigenous ancestry. Terpel Lafon told CBC News that her dad, Bill, was Cree. She also said that he was raised by her grandparents, William and Eleanor Terpel. But genealogical records show that her grandparents were of European and American ancestry. CBC News asked Terpel Lafon, given that, how could her dad be Cree? In an email, she didn't answer directly, only hinting at family secrets. There was a Dr. Turpel at Norway House, 
when I was just a boy. The Turples were not Cree. They were white people. The claim is also disputed by 93-year-old Joe Keeper from Norway House, who went to school with Turpel Lafon's father. He doubts her dad was Cree. He was not a Indian boy, he was a white boy. The first I've ever heard of Billy being Indian is when I've heard it from you. CBC News asked Turpel Lafond where and when her dad was born. She refused to say, so CBC went looking for records. A newspaper announcement and a baptismal record obtained by CBC both say her dad was born in Victoria, B.C., and his parents were Dr. William and Eleanor Turpel. Mark Humphreys, a history professor from Wilfrid Laurier University, helped CBC examine a wide range of historical records. In that normal way of doing things, as an historian, when you see all these records line up, it would be very hard for me as an historian to not conclude that the boy born in Victoria was, in fact, the son of William L. Northbell. The Harvard and Cambridge-educated legal scholar has served as a law professor and judge and children's advocate. She's also received honorary doctorates from 11 universities. Over the past decade, she has been the voice of those who cannot be heard, particularly those from Aboriginal communities. Because Trapel LaFond didn't say who her father's biological parents were, CBC reached out to one of her sisters. She said she believed her dad was either adopted from a Cree family or was the product of an affair involving her grandfather and a Cree woman. But CBC has found no evidence to support that claim. And Trapel LaFond has declined to provide her Indian status card or even say if she has one. And Jeff, this, of course, isn't the first time this kind of allegation has been made against someone. Yeah, no, definitely not. I mean, over the past year and a half uh, here in Saskatchewan, I've looked into a number of claims uh, about non-Indigenous people who have claimed to be Indigenous. And there's a lot of concern out there about this because uh, people say it can rob Indigenous people, genuine Indigenous people, of opportunities like scholarships or jobs that are meant specifically for them. And so in this case, uh, some people say Trapel Lafond has benefited from her claims and therefore has an obligation to answer questions about them. But she doesn't see it that way. No, she definitely doesn't. She's refused to do an interview with us, and she's, in fact, said questioning her ancestry was offensive and was a violation of her privacy. Uh, in an email, she did point out to us that she has been accepted as a member of her husband's community, the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation here in Saskatchewan. And her supporters say if a First Nations community has accepted her, that should be good enough for everyone. All right, Jeff Leo in Saskatchewan. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, you're welcome. Next on The National, a voting scandal of gargantuan proportions found about 9,000 spam votes. The competition that barely ended well in our moment. Look at that. It took weeks of lying in dirt in Texas to capture this photo of a frenzied bundle of cactus bees trying to mate with a female in the middle. But no doubt the U.S. photographer behind it, Corrine Eigner, would say it was worth it. The image won her Wildlife Photographer of the Year. It's a prestigious award given out by the Natural History Museum in London. There were 38,000 entries this year. Finalists included a close-up of the filters in a whale's mouth. Can you see the sardines trying to escape there? And the final moments of an orphaned mountain gorilla in the arms of her lifelong caregiver. And in a way, you're looking at another winner. This bear, known simply as 747, won a competition by gaining weight. So the contest, Fat Bear Week, held annually at Alaska's Katmai Park. But this year, something fishy was going on with the voting, and that's the moment. So Fat Bear Week is a like bracket-style March Madness competition where we pit the fattest bears at Katmai National Park against each other, and uh, viewers vote for who they believe is the fattest. So we first noticed something was wrong when Bear 435 Holly came back from a 6,000 vote deficit pretty late in the day. It's not unheard of for a bear to come out back, but usually the bear who takes an early lead wins. We decided to manually download all the votes and sort through the votes by hand. And at which point we found about 9,000 spam votes on the poll. Um, so we manually removed those, 
put it put up the new vote total the vote wasn't stolen the vast majority of the fraudulent votes were for 435 holly i don't know what the motivation behind that was if we hadn't caught it holly would have won but we did luckily the winner was 747 so he came back from a very contentious semi-final with holly which was the closest match despite the fraud voting to win it all against fair 901 who was the youngest fair to make it to the finals Okay, there's a lot going on here. Are, are people betting on Fat Bear Week? Listen, the, the deal is 747 was seen eating like maybe 15 sockeye salmon, roughly 63,000 calories, or, you know, me on Thanksgiving. Uh, they think maybe he weighs in the neighborhood of 635 kilos neighborhood because, unhelpfully, the bear will not get on the scale. That is a national for October the 12th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.